nervous and worried. That's West Asia right now. It's been almost 48 hours since Iran attacked Israel. But so far, Israel has not responded, mostly thanks to global pressure. We've seen different statements from different camps. The West has criticized Iran. China and Russia have criticized Israel, and the Arab states did not criticize anyone. But all these statements had one thing in common. They all urged restraint. And we saw more of that at the United Nations. Israel had called for a Security Council meeting. They tried to rally opinion against they Iran. But most UNSC members had the same message to give. No. You must de-escalate. Our goal is to de-escalate and then get back to the issue at hand, securing an end to the conflict in Gaza by getting a ceasefire in Gaza through a hostage deal. We urge the West and Jerusalem to follow suit and reject the practice of provocative use of force in the Middle East, as they are fraught with extremely dangerous risks, risks and consequences for the whole region. China calls on the parties concerned to show maximum calm and restraint and resolve their differences and disputes in accordance with the purposes of the UN Charter. So the red lines are clear. No one wants Israel to retaliate, not its allies in the West, not the Arab states, and not Russia, China, or India. If they want to do it, they must do it alone. Which raises the most important question. Is Israel capable of such an operation? Can they ignore global sentiment and attack alone? Iran is hoping it won't come to that. Their ambassador said so at the United Nations Security Council. He said the operation was designed to limit the scope for escalation. But Israel is not buying it. Their ambassador said Iran crossed a red line, so they have the right to retaliate. You are wrong. This attack crossed every red line, and Israel reserves the legal right to retaliate. We are not a frog in boiling water. We are a nation of lions. It was precise and only targeted military objectives and carried out carefully to minimize the potential for escalation and prevent civilian harm. But again, can Israel do it alone? They have carried out operations inside Iran, like cyber attacks to cripple their nuclear program and assassinations of Iranian scientists. But those attacks were different, A, because the West supported them, and B, because it was a shadow war. So Israel could turn around and say, not us. But an open military attack is a different ballgame altogether. It's a scenario Israel has often prepared for. In June last year, for example, they carried out a two-week military drill. The focus was on Iran, on how to fight a multi-front war against them. So Israel does have the planning and the resources. But are they ready for what could come next? Like a full-blown war with Iran, are they ready for that? Usually, such solo operations require four things, or four conditions. Number one, your economy must be able to take the hit. But Israel's economy is struggling. Their GDP shrank in the last three months of 2023, that is last year, the last three months of last year. It shrank. By how much? Almost 5%. Their exports have also been affected. In 2023, Israeli exports were worth $156 billion dollars which is 6% down compared to 2022. So can Israel bankroll a long multi-front war? With US support, yes, they can. But without it, maybe not. The second condition is political support. Do you have the backing of a coalition? Do you have allies on your side? Again, in this case, the answer is no. The US and the UK have refused to support a counter-strike. They have lots of assets in West Asia. But if war breaks out, these assets could become targets. So military aid may continue, but direct support is not 100% certain. Now we come to condition number three, military superiority. Iran has more soldiers, warships, and natural resources. Yes, Israel's army is more advanced, but Iran fights unconventionally. You can expect their proxies to open multiple fronts. So the point is, victory is not certain. And finally, condition number four, domestic support. And that's not a problem for Iran. Saturday's attack has rallied the public there. We've seen celebrations and fireworks in Tehran. So Iranians are ready for it. Look at this message posted by the Ayatollah. It's a video of Iranian drones over the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And look at the caption. Jerusalem will soon be in Muslim hands. So fighting Israel is a popular policy in Iran. And even if it wasn't, 
people can't do very much there because Iran's supreme leader has an iron grip over the country. But Israel's situation is different. Prime Minister Netanyahu is already unpopular. Most Israelis think that he is mishandling the war in Gaza. So will they trust him to lead another war? It's among the many questions facing Netanyahu. Of course, Israel can just ignore all of this like the Americans did in Iraq or like the Russians are doing in Ukraine. But remember, Israel is not Russia or the US. They may not be able to sustain a war without support. And don't forget the tactical issues. Iran and Israel are separated by other countries like Syria, Iraq and Jordan. So how would Israeli missiles even reach Iran? There are Russian assets in Syria, Iranian proxies in Iraq, and Jordan is not exactly happy with Israel's war in Gaza. So any of them could shoot down Israel's missiles. Some experts think the sea could be an option. Israel has around five submarines. They can fire cruise missiles from the Indian Ocean. It does eliminate the issue of airspace, but still one problem remains. Iran's navy is far superior to Israel. So my point here is quite simple. There are no easy options. Israel could use jets and missiles to target Iranian sites. They're also capable of doing it all alone, but they may not be ready for what happens next. A multi-front war, global isolation, and pushback from allies.